Hello, everyone, and uh, gosh, thank you very much for taking a Wednesday, a lovely Wednesday late summer evening to come along and hear an economist uh, of all things. Oh, my God, you all need to get out more, I'd say. But uh, uh, it's very gratifying to see such interest in a topic like this. It's uh, very important, uh, obviously, to the future of our movement and the future of our society, frankly. And uh, I have to say, you've been leading the way in WA, so... Uh, uh, tribute to uh, you, Meredith, and your movement and the allies that you've built. I know there's folks from the um, uh, Save Our Services Coalition and the other uh, coalitions that you've been uh, putting together, and that's the way to do it. You know, it can't be seen as a special interest group uh, that's out there defending its own piece of the pie. It has to be seen as a social movement that reflects the broader social good. And I think that you've positioned that extremely well here and uh, given everyone in Australia and elsewhere a model for how to fight to defend uh, these things. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so uh, Center for Future Work, uh, there's our website, uh, research institute focusing on work, jobs, the future of work, uh, fairness, wages, uh, etc. There's my Twitter handle and our center's uh, Twitter handle. You're more than welcome to uh, uh, join the conversation that way tonight if you'd like. Uh, I've come here from Canberra, okay? I'm from Canberra and I'm here to help you, right? You've, <laughs> you've heard that before, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here partly because it means I'm not in Canberra, right? Because I was there for the budget last night and, uh, and staying up, uh, you know, crunching the numbers uh, on all that. So uh, much better to be here with, uh, with you folks and talking about what comes next. Because believe me, uh, there's a technical term that for what went on in Canberra last night. Uh, that we study in economics is called bullshit. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a term that means hypothesis unsubstantiated by empirical verification. Right? Okay, so I, you know, popular education, I've learned this over the years, Meredith. You have to explain your terms as you go along. Um, anyways, we were crunching the numbers on the bullshit last night, and I've just got to take a minute before we jump into the privatization uh, debate to, to talk a bit about that. Of course, we had, you know, our blokey bloke common man. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison, uh, I'm surprised he wasn't wearing, you know, one of his caps uh, last night to try and look at how ordinary he is. And now they're invoking ACDC, right, as the thing. I heard ACDC on the radio all day today uh, of everybody jumping on board this back in black thing. So he, of course, is the guy who replaced a Prime Minister who couldn't name an ACDC song. Remember that? <laughs> so they're not actually blokey blokes. They're not actually the common folk. Uh, no matter how hard they try. But if I was going ACDC, I wouldn't have done black, back in black. I'd do dirty deeds done dirt cheap. Uh, or perhaps highway to hell might be, <laughs> might be the more uh, fitting one. But frankly, if I was to pick an entertainer to sum up the budget, it would not be ACDC at all. In fact, I would go full Britney. <laughs> full Britney. Oops, I did it again. Okay, and what did they do again? Here's the thing, okay? For six years, okay, since 2013, coincidentally the year they came to power, wages in Australia have been growing at the slowest sustained pace since the end of the Second World War. Okay, that's quite a claim. And it's true. And every one of the budgets that they brought down during those six years, okay, of unprecedentedly slow wage growth, every year they brought down a budget that said, boom, wages are going to bounce right back up next year. Every one. So I'm going to show you a graph that if, uh, if anyone's hung over from budget night last night, you're not going to appreciate this one. <laughs> this is a very interesting graph. This shows the actual course of wage growth in Australia over the last six years. That's the thick black line. And then the thin lines, like all these little kind of tentacles coming off of it, if you like, are the wage forecasts <laughs> from every one of their budgets. Every <laughs> one of their budgets. Now, I've updated this graph at 2 a.m. with the current forecast, this one there. So every year, as wages fell lower and lower and lower, the government comes out and says, good times are just around the corner. Wages are going to pick up in a very sustained and dramatic fashion. And that's very convenient in a budget, because guess what wa higher wages mean for the treasurer? Higher taxes, right? And if it was true, you know, we wouldn't mind. We don't mind paying a share of our wages if the wages are going up. But, and so it's very convenient <clears throat> on budget night for the government to say, yeah, wages are going up. Uh, it means they can make the numbers look better, like this so-called surplus. We actually aren't back in black. They're projecting that we will be back in black. It hasn't happened yet. It may happen. It doesn't matter, frankly, whether it happens. But 
it's still dependent on this incredibly robust assumption that wages are going to suddenly start growing like they used to. They used to grow at three and a half, four, four and a half, every now and then five percent a year. Some of you might even remember wage increases uh, of that score, and it's only in the last few years that we've really, really dipped down. So, oops, I did it again. This is now the sixth forecast of their budgets that they've brought in. Each budget has four years of forecast, right? The, the two um, of the um, f uh, estimates and the two forward projections. So four years in each year times six, that's 24. That's why I got a PhD in economics, okay? I can just <laughs> stand here and do that kind of thing. Four <laughs> years, six years, that's 24 years of forecast. Every one of them has been wrong. Okay, they're zero for 24, and then this one's going to be wrong too. Obviously, it's already wrong. In fact, all they did this year, look at the numbers, the, the, the two lines. The orange line was last year. The dark blue line is this year. They're totally parallel. They took exactly the same numbers to the dollar and just postponed it a year. That's literally what they did. It's like they cut and pasted it from last year and said, uh, no, not this year, but next year. Not this year, but next year. That could be their election slogan, I think. Uh, Anyways, uh, it's a bit of a joke, except it's not a joke, because it actually means people don't have money to spend, which means, uh, A, their households are under financial stress, B, their living standards are going nowhere, and C, the whole economy suffers as a result. So imagine if we had actually received the wage increases that were forecast by those successive rose-colored budget forecasts, right? <laughs> Start in May 2014, uh, when they brought down their first budget. That was the Joe Hockey budget. Uh, <laughs> which we largely defeated, so good on us, uh, a nasty piece of work. Um, if, you'd have, if you had, from that point on, earned the wage forecasts that they predicted, we'd be following the blue line. In reality, we're following uh, the black line, uh, about 2% a year, barely enough to keep up with inflation. And the difference is now $4,000. Uh, average full-time worker today would be earning $4,000 a year more than they actually are if their forecasts had uh, come true. So you can't just, however, uh, make a promise uh, in, a, in a budget and hope that the wages are going to happen. You have to have a plan and policies to make it happen, like a living wage, uh, for example, like rebuilding uh, collective bargaining, which is uh, falling apart in Australia, especially in the private sector, uh, like pay equity, um, uh, and so on. Uh, and without that plan, they're, they're promise of wage increases is, is really just uh, another bit of hot air. We did the numbers last night regarding this big tax cut that they say, tax cut targeted at low and middle income uh, workers. And uh, if you believe that, I uh, have a bridge in the desert in Arizona that <laughs> I think you might be quite interested in. Uh, you get anywhere between zero, if you make 20000 a year, you get nothing from it. Uh, up to a whole grand $550 uh, in the middle income uh, range. And you, we can calculate what does that mean in terms of your pre-tax income, and it ranges from zero to somewhere less than 1%. And you only get it once, remember? They pay it year after year, in theory, if they were re-elected, but they can't grow it year after year. So in terms of the increase in your living standard, it happens once. One increase of less than 1% in your uh, disposable income. Compare that to what, we, what we'd be doing if we were actually getting the wage increases that we need and that they promised. 3.5% is a, actually at the conservative end of the traditional range of wage increases. 3.5% is what Philip Lowe, governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, said would be a minimum normal healthy wage increase. That's pretty good when the governor of the Reserve Bank is coming out saying, yeah, give the workers more, right? That doesn't happen often, and that tells you how bad things are. Usually he's the guy who comes in and takes the punch bowl away as soon as the party is getting fun, right? <laughs> now he's coming in pouring bottles of straight tequila into the punch <laughs> to try and get the party going. Uh, so 3.5%, imagine if you got that. If you got it once, once, you've done several times better than this phony tax cut, but that's not how wages work. Wages work year after year after year. That's the whole point. They compound over time. Because every time, you know, many of you have helped to negotiate wage increases. Every time you bargain a wage increase, it's applied to a base that's a little bit higher thanks to the wage increase you got the previous year. And that compounding over time is how we build inclusive prosperity. So just three years, that's one term of government, three years of those wage increases, you're getting between 6 and 10% improvement 
compared to this piddly little tax cut. So when Josh Frydenberg or Scott Morrison stands up and says, yes, I feel your pain, I know wages haven't been growing as fast, but at least our tax cuts are going to let you keep more of your own hard-earned money for you battlers out there, okay? Tell them, use that technical term I mentioned uh, earlier <laughs> and say, no, we need uh, wage increases. Um, the government cannot just draw another line on a graph. That wage forecast yesterday is, is laughable. No one believes it anymore, and with good reason. We need an actual plan to get wage increases, and that's what the Change the Rules fight. And the big demo on Wednesday, uh, how did you get Sally McManus here for the demo? Like, what is that about? It's like the center of power is shifting west or something. Yes. Wow. All right. Anyway, so that's what that's all about. So that was my, I had to get it off my chest. I stayed up all damn night doing those numbers. I had to tell somebody about it. So okay. there we go. Now, the topic at hand tonight, uh, the many ugly faces of privatization. Uh, you guys have done a great job, as I mentioned, defending uh, the principle of public ownership with the, the, the victory on the uh, electricity system. Um, also, uh, the victory on the um, land registry that uh, I know the CPSU, CSA folks and others uh, work so hard on. And the problem is, it's like uh, Hercules fighting um, one of these monsters. You lop off one head and lo and behold, another one shows up. And what's happening is because the architects of privatization are realizing they're losing, okay, they're trying to change tack. They're trying to rebrand. They're trying to dress up the same old ideas in new garb and hope that we're uh, tricked by it. So that's what we'll go through uh, tonight. So <clears throat> I want to propose a kind of operational definition of privatization that we can keep in mind uh, so that every time we confront one of these new fads, you know, one of these new, you know, uh, new, new outfits on the whole plan, we can come back to this traditional broad definition and see does it fit or not. And it's simple. The whole idea of privatization is to organize things so that you can extract private profit from the operation and production of a public good or service. Okay, so you've got some kind of workplace going on, work is being done, value is being added, <clears throat> goods or services are being produced. Usually we think of the public sector in terms of services, but it doesn't have to be that way. The public sector can also be involved in goods production. Uh, for example, utilities is considered part of the goods side of the economy, and that can be public. There's all kinds of things that can be public. It doesn't just have to be services, but mostly uh, the public sector does services. But we'll keep it general. Uh, finding a way to extract profit from the production of public goods or services. That's the operation uh, goal, if you like, <clears throat> of uh, privatization, the general uh, definition. And so let's keep this in mind, and then we'll come back to it as we consider some of the different things uh, that we're uh, confronting. So <clears throat> if that's the general goal, the interesting thing is, and the challenging thing for us, there's a number of different ways and a number of different places that that goal can be applied. And we should have a sense in our head of how it all fits together so that we can understand where it's happening, okay? So let's map out. Uh, this whole process of producing public goods and services. So here's a, a workplace, okay? This one looks like an early childhood education uh, facility. There's a public service uh, being produced, but it could be anything. It could be a, a hospital, it could be a university, uh, it could be a local government service of some kind, it could be a utility, okay? Um, here we are, uh, work is happening, and uh, the point is of public services, the motivation for the production of public goods and services is to provide some benefit to the community. That's why we do it, okay? And this is different than what happens in the rest of the economy. This is different than what happens in the private sector of the economy, where the motivation for production is to do something, sell it, and hope that you've got a profit left at the end of the day, okay? Sometimes that profit motive is useful and, you know, promotes innovation and efficiency and useful things. Sometimes it's utterly useless. Okay, there are lots of things that happen in society that are profitable but useless or actually counterproductive. They're actually destructive. Um, so never confuse making a profit with doing something useful. Okay, those are two different terms. My favorite example is <clears throat> how I constantly get an uh, unsolicited phone call, usually at dinner time, okay, <laughs> trying to sell me something I have no interest in. Okay, that activity is profitable. It's profiting someone, otherwise it wouldn't be occurring, but it's useless. Um, and the fact they can find people in India to do it for a couple cents a call, right, makes it all the more profitable and all the more useless. Uh, so 
Um, in the public sector, you're doing it for a different reason. It's because we, as residents of a community, have empowered a government or some other agency to organize production, deliver a good or service in order to benefit uh, the community. And the way we make it happen is we pay taxes uh, in order to pay for the production of that useful uh, good or service. So here you've got a simple loop that describes what goes on in the public sector. Now, like any other workplace, this one doesn't stand alone. It's not an island unto itself. There's things that feed into that workplace, things that it needs, a, a sort of supporting cast behind the scenes. One of them is capital. You have to have uh, money in order to build that facility, uh, endow it with the initial equipment and uh, working capital and so on that it needs uh, to do its uh, thing. You need somebody to actually build the facility because there's some kind of tangible uh, uh, property, tangible building, tangible workshop, tangible hospital, tangible school, something where the work occurs and it has to be uh, constructed. And then we also need to have the supplies and services and inputs and raw materials and paper clips, okay, that go into that facility that are used by it in order to uh, make it function. So this is kind of a supply chain, if you like, that feeds into the public sector operation, just like there's a supply chain that feeds into uh, any private sector workplace. If it was a factory, you'd have a whole lineup of suppliers, you know, doing parts and um, uh, materials and uh, sub-assemblies. Uh, same goes for a mine or, or for a bank or anything else. Same thing is true for a uh, public sector uh, operation. So here's a picture of the whole thing. Now, where are we going to face the demand for privatization? Anywhere. That's the point. Okay, and this is where we have to prepare ourselves, almost like we're playing one of those whack-a-mole games, right, at the fair, at the summer fair, you know, where the squirrel or whatever, yeah, I know that we're in, we're in Australia here, Jim. Uh, the bilby, is it a bilby that pokes us up and you wham it down? No, you'd lose the kids uh, on that, wouldn't you? Uh, a possum, a possum, a what? A crocodile pops its head up and you whack it down. Okay. Okay, whack the crocodile. You whack it down once, and lo and behold, it pops up over here, right? That's exactly what we're up against here. Where does privatization occur? It could occur in the whole thing, okay? It is possible to imagine taking the whole thing, the whole operation, and transferring it from public operation and finance to the private sector. This would mean the government washes its hands and says, this isn't our business anymore. We're going to leave it to the private sector. Okay? The private sector can undertake the production, they can supply the capital, they can build the facility, they can do all the um, uh, supply chain and procurement, and by the way, pay for it. Okay? That would be total privatization, shift the whole thing to the private market. So this taxes piece of it disappears, and it's now going to be production for profit that hopefully, in their view, enough people buy in order to cover all those costs and make a profit at the end of the day. This is, the, in a way, the purest form of privatization. It's kind of what the free market economists are thinking about when they say, get government out of the way. And it almost never happens. Almost never happens. Because here's the funny thing, uh, okay, about uh, the capitalists when we're arguing with them. They always say they want government out of the way. They actually don't want government out of the way, okay? They want government to do different stuff than they're doing. They want government to butter their bread instead of ours but they don't want government out of the way. Especially they don't want this out of the way. They don't want the flow of money from the public sector to facilitate and subsidize and make viable whatever undertaking they're thinking about. So this is very rare. Um, so instead, you look at privatizing different pieces of it, okay? So obviously, they could privatize the actual operation itself, okay? If it was a school, they could transfer it to a private school instead of a public school. If it was a utility, transfer it to a private utility instead of a public utility. Uh, so that's uh, obviously one way to do it. Another way to do it is to maintain the public operation of the actual productive site itself, but privatize the capital ownership of it uh, so that private investors, even though it's an operation that's paid for by the public and perhaps even managed and, and organized by the public, there's still a way for a profit to be extracted in the sense of the investors who put up some of the initial money uh, to capitalize it. Uh, another place they could get a profit would be to undertake the, the role of building the facility. So 
So a private build kind of arrangement where there's, uh, it's still a public service and it's still being financed by the public and operated by the public, but the facility itself is built by the private sector and perhaps managed in a kind of um, uh, uh, facility or infrastructure uh, type of way. And you could also look at getting more private activity and more private profit extracted from the supply chain that feeds into the uh, public sector uh, operation um, as a way of, um, again, you still got public production and public finance of it, but you've got private companies that are finding ways to make money from different pieces of it. And this is where the pressure is there all the time to outsource segments of the work that go on here in the public facility and outsource it to private suppliers uh, who feed in. So in essence, there's all kinds of different ways that privatization can look at the big picture and say, I'm going to try to extract a little profit here. I'm going to extract a little profit there. Very rarely is it actually transferred en masse uh, to, the, to the private market because that would mean that they lose this. And the, the hypocrisy of the privatizers on this score is amazing. Like, you know, the idea that, yes, government should get out of the way, markets are all knowing and efficient, uh, we'd be better off, uh, you know, some, I sound like someone from the Productivity Commission here, okay? Uh, speaking of coming from Canberra, oh my God, uh, don't let them in. And <laughs> by all means, don't let the Productivity Commission design your social programs, okay? This is, uh, this is where uh, it all starts to fall apart. You know, they'll come and say, you know, government should get out of the way. Uh, private markets are more efficient, uh, better cost control, et cetera, et cetera. But, there's always a but, okay? So my favorite but uh, example is the uh, uh, private health insurance system here. I, I was uh, blown away when I learned this when I came from uh, Canada is, is my homeland, according to Tony Abbott, Can Canada. <laughs> when I came from Canada to Australia, okay, and I learned that if you don't get private health insurance, which I didn't, you have to pay more income tax, okay? Now, talk about leaving things up to the private market, eh, and, and incentive structure and cost-benefit decisions. And by the way, here's government with a big honking stick to hit you over the head if you don't buy from the private sector, okay? So that's, that's one of many examples of hypocrisy you can see in property development or uh, mining developments or all kinds of other things that have got big public money in it while the architects and uh, bosses talk about the rationality of the private uh, sector. Uh, so just to sum up, there's all kinds of places to be looking for this. One would be full privatization of the whole thing and actually get government out of the way. Very rare. It's hard to think of an example of it. It's so rare. The, the closest I could think in Australia might be Telstra and the whole telecom thing. But even there, they've left a bunch of public money in with the NBN and uh, all the other infrastructure and so on. So even that wasn't truly getting out of the way. Uh, it was privatizing uh, parts of it. You can contract and outsource the production itself, either from the facility or from the to and from the supply chain. Those are places where uh, private firms can uh, aim for money. You can have private ownership of the capital, even though the public is still paying for and potentially even operating and producing uh, the service. Private build, very common, uh, where they, uh, a full public uh, operation, uh, the facilities are still constructed and maybe managed, or maybe the whole construction process is managed by higher level private contractors who find ways to uh, extract profits, sometimes on a long-term basis, not just for the building period itself. Um, another one to keep an eye on, this one's kind of tricky, is the whole concept of uh, marketization or uh, sometimes called contestability, where uh, it's argued, again, sounds like the Productivity Commission here, um, take public, uh, public agencies and, and public um, production and subject it to the same discipline and the same rules and the same benchmarks and incentives as a private firm would face. And um, you don't necessarily have to sell it to the private firm. You just tell the managers to act as if you are a private firm. Um, and the idea there is that you'll force them to become more efficient. This was the thin end, of the edge, thin end of the wedge that helped to destroy vocational education in uh, Australia, which is one of the great disasters, of course, uh, where they said, well, we'll keep the TAFEs. They'll still be publicly owned, but you have to function like uh, you're privately owned. And you know, pay your own way, blah, 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 blah. It isn't, more, it isn't necessarily privatization in its own right, but it's usually a precursor to it. 
um, including in the vocational education example where they did set up a bunch of private uh, providers as well. But we're dealing with a complex multi-headed beast here. This is the hydra that uh, we put up there at the beginning and we have to be on our toes and we have to have enough awareness of uh, their tricks of the trade to be able to spot what uh, they're trying to do. And that's where I say come back to that initial definition. Is there somebody trying to extract private profit from uh, production of a public good or service? If so, it is ultimately a form of privatization, no matter what uh, you call it. Uh, one last thing I want to do on this map. Um, there's no um, scientific or neutral or permanent way of defining what is public sector and what, it, what should be public sector and what should be private sector, okay? Sometimes the economists will try to come up with an elegant theory as to where it makes sense for the public sector to be and, and where the private sector should dominate, but there is no technical answer to it. There's always a fight over where you draw that line, and it's been going on forever. So even in regards to something as simple as building the facility, you know, it's a long time since we had you know, state-employed construction workers who went out to build the bridge, right? For ages, they've been hiring private contractors to do it. Likewise, it's a really long time since we had uh, nationalized paperclip industry, okay, in Australia that public offices could buy their paperclips from, right? They go to office works and buy the paperwork, paper clips just like the rest of us do. So there's no perfect answer, and it's always under debate. It's always contested where the line should be drawn between public and private spheres. And we're always going to have to be contesting that. Um, so um, the reality is um, there's no perfect answer to what should be public and what should be private. And if somebody tells you there is, um, they're trying to trick you. Uh, what we should do is think about these different types of activity and if there's a good argument why it should be public, either because the quality is better or the jobs are better or it's more democratic and accountable, okay, then we should feel absolutely free in pushing that argument and not accept any kind of um, prior assumption that the public sector should only be in here, here, and here. Um, that we stop the tide, uh, including right here in uh, WA. Uh, particularly in the 90s and the 2000s, Australia had a very aggressive, very far-reaching privatization program. In fact, in the 90s, um, there was more privatization here relative to GDP than any other Western capitalist country uh, in that period. Um, the only countries that privatized faster than Australia were the former uh, communist countries of Eastern Europe, where they were selling anything that, that wasn't bolted down and many things that were bolted down. Um, so um, Australia's record was quite extreme. <laughs> Similarly, Australia has been a pioneer in some of these um, newfangled, dressed up, rebranded forms of privatization, public-private partnerships, for example, um, which um, are kind of uh, not in fashion anymore, uh, but they were intended to be a, a way of dressing up the whole idea of privatization. Australia has the third highest number of PPPs uh, still today of any uh, industrial country. Um, and I've, I've thought about that, why did that happen? And I do think it's partly because of the influence of this kind of technocratic vision that there's a, a rational way to organize the economy. You know, the, the idea, what neoliberalism here was first called economic rationalism, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's still called economic reform. It's still described as economic reform. And, and you'll hear people, um, you know, obviously in the Murdoch press, but even elsewhere in, in actually respectable organizations uh, <laughs> saying, what happened to economic reform? We still need more economic reform. You know, I agree, we need economic reform, but it isn't remotely what they're thinking about as economic reform. Um, so that kind of pseudo-neutral technocratic language and idea ideology helped to get it through. So did the fact that much of the privatization occurred under... Um, ALP governments, um, you know, for various uh, unique historical and political reasons. Um, so, um, in a way, we've got more damage to fix uh, here. Now, this is just one picture of how uh, dramatic it was. Uh, this is not a, a perfect measure of privatization, but it's a, an indicative one. This looks at the share of total operating surplus in the economy in the non-financial productive sphere, non-financial, non-governmental sphere. So, we're not looking at government and government agencies, healthcare schools, etc. We're looking at the 
you know, so-called sort of business uh, side of the economy, and there was traditionally a significant public-owned sector, uh, a public-owned share of that in things like transportation, communications, banking, um, uh, and so on. And starting particularly in the 90s and the 2000s, you had a dramatic decline from something like a fifth of, the, of that part of the economy being publicly owned down to now just uh, 5%. Uh, so a decline of over three quarters uh, of the public uh, assets in that sphere of the economy. Um, again, not counting the operation of government itself or uh, government uh, services. Um, 5%, that's 1 20th, so it's still a significant thing, you know, in terms of the publicly owned utilities and publicly owned transportation services and so on that we still have, but um, we have a lot of uh, rebuilding to do and it certainly makes it all the more important to hang on to uh, what we can. Now, when the privatizers are arguing why this is necessary, they always invoke this highfalutin um, economic jargon usually. They'll argue that the private sector produces stuff more efficiently than the public sector and generally don't go into a lot of detail about, you know, how does that happen? What is the miracle that, that actually makes that occur? Um, in terms of the private build end of things, they argue that the private sector is more efficient there as well, including managing the whole process to avoid cost overruns uh, and so on. And, you know, gosh, I, I've certainly seen that in action in the private construction industry in Australia. Um, you know, like for example, when the private uh, construction sector decided to buy, uh, build five LNG plants all at the same time, three of them on the same small island, and I, I don't think there was too much of a cost overrun there. I think it might have been about a $200 billion uh, cost overrun in that private sector uh, efficient operation. Uh, the other one they throw out, of course, is that the government is broke. Uh, the government needs to sell off those assets in order to get money. Uh, now, that's a very ludicrous and extreme version of it, but you still hear it. A somewhat more subtle uh, version, because the reality is government is not broke, in fact government cannot go broke, um, is that the government is finance constrained and there are better things for us to do with that money rather than own these particular assets. This is the sort of approach that underlies this asset recycling argument, that yes, we do want to invest in new public infrastructure, say public transit, but the only way we can afford to do that is by selling off something else that the public sector owns. You know, imagine if you told um, BHP, Billiton, and uh, and all of them that that you know you can invest in something, but you have to sell something off first. My mom used to tell me that when I was a kid. You know, you can get a new toy, but you have to give away one of the toys that you've got, <laughs> right? Um, it's a Jim's mom theory of uh, <laughs> asset recycling, and it's also uh, wrong. <laughs> Let's put ourselves in the brains of the privatizers, okay, without taking their side, and think about what their real rationale is, because you have to, in a way, know your enemy uh, if you're going to defeat them. The general description of privatization, again, is finding a way to extract private profit from the production of a public good or service. So, duh. Uh, they're interested in privatization because it's going to create new opportunities to do that, new opportunities to extract profit <coughs> from real production, so the actual production that's going on in that workplace that we showed or in the supply chain that we showed. Secondly, and very importantly these days, uh, opportunities to extract profit from financial activity related to the scheme. We live in a very financialized economy where the, the paper markets, if you like, or the paper economy, as I call it, the people who buy and sell pieces of paper, whether they're stocks or bonds or debentures uh, or social impact bonds, you know, a new cleverly named piece of paper, okay? They ultimately are just pieces of paper. They're claims to assets and they, um, there's a whole industry called uh, the financial sector that um, lives off of creating, selling, taking a big commission on and then reselling and rebuying hundreds of times over, taking a smaller commission on each sale and that's uh, an enormously profitable activity, as we've seen with the banks. Uh, so, um, uh, privatization is an incredibly lucrative opportunity. When the government sells something and issues a whole bunch of paper, whatever kind of paper it is, typically the investment bankers they go to to facilitate that process will take three, three and a half percent of the whole deal. Okay, and you're talking billions of dollars. Uh, three, three and a half percent of billions of dollars is uh, a lot of money. Um, so that financialized dimension is one we need to keep an eye on. 
clearly a motivation for privatization all along, sometimes again from the uh, ALP governments that did it, is to impose some kind of discipline or some kind of downward pressure on workers, their unions and labor costs. There's no doubt about that. That uh, at times when, you know, it was felt the unions were out of control and wages were too high and we had a wages overhang, they call it. You never hear about a profit overhang, I've noticed, <laughs> right? That's what we've got today, no doubt about that. Uh, one way to solve it was to uh, hand it over, hand the problem over to the, the private bosses and have them basically, you know, suppress and exploit those workers as effectively as private sector uh, companies do. Um, and we have to be, uh, first of all, cognizant that is part of their motivation, and I think we all, we already knew that, um, and, and be ready to fight back about it. But uh, it, with messaging, that works for the public as a whole, right? We can't have our campaign seen as just us who work in a public sector place trying to defend our own decent jobs, right? That's a legitimate goal to fight for, but we won't win it if that's how, they, uh, if the, if that's how the whole movement is phrased. It has to be to, to defend something that benefits all of society. Uh, this is an interesting one. There's always a group of, uh, you know, um, uh, greedy wannabes uh, in public sector management who look over at how much money they make as CEOs or assistant CEOs or assistant assistant CEOs in the private sector and say, how come I'm not making that much money? How come I'm only making 200000 a year when those people over there are making a million a year? And this can be really important as a motivator, especially because these people, the senior managers inside, have got a lot of influence over public policy and how it unfolds. Uh, I also think there's a broader kind of political economic um, project at stake here, uh, if I can use such a, uh, such a phrase, um, to use privatization to shrink the public sector, give the public sector less power, less impact uh, in the economy, perhaps cut taxes after the public sector has been shrunk, and generally reinforce a kind of animal farm ideology, you know, private sector good, public sector bad private sector creates value, uh, the public sector is a giant hole in the ground that sucks money uh, down, right? Nonsense, of course, the public sector creates value uh, at least as much and more reliably than the private sector creates value. And the public sector measures its value in terms of actual human well-being that is created by their services as opposed to inflation in a stock market valuation. Um, did you see, by the way, oh, I've got to, I've got to get this off my chest, this, uh, this thing in the Australian on the weekend, this uh, glossy magazine with the 250 richest sons of bitches in the land. <laughs> oh, that was nauseating. Oh, the guy on the front who was the richest person who now just beat out Gina Reinhart, um, what's his name, Pratt. And then he's there, and he's, and he's sitting there like a capitalist. You know, at, that was this thing. There's so many pictures of, the, of these guys on yachts, swimming in a swimming pool in their full tuxedo and, and, and celebrating, um, just celebrating excess, really. It, it was so nauseating. And Pratt was on the front, you know, sitting there like this in a big chair, and he had socks. And you could see the socks were custom-made socks that had his own face all over his own socks. <laughs> Can you believe that? And could you imagine? Yeah, he was in his, his big castle, exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we can tell which socks are his. That was the, the, the true thing. Well put. Those uh, 250 people have con combined wealth of $320 billion. I went through and added it up. Um, the uh, bottom 20% of the Australian population, so that's about 6 million people, have combined financial wealth of $32 billion. So those 250 people have 10 times as much wealth as the bottom fifth of our society. And when John Howard said that, he said, inequality is a myth. Uh, apparently, that's... They work hard. We're, we've, in a way, we've won the debate over whether privatization is good or not. I think I, I'm overstating it to say we won it. We worked hard in the campaign, but it's also the reality of privatization has been pretty ugly. Um, and people have experienced it through their own lives. What privatized electricity means, privatized phone companies mean, uh, other privatized services. So this is a poll, this is a couple years out of date from 2015, but I don't think the numbers have changed a lot. Uh, 
in terms of how do people feel about some of the core values that were used to justify privatization. So selling off public utilities to private companies will help the economy. 25% of people agreed, 53% disagreed, so over two to one against it. Um, even some of the more sort of technical arguments, like private companies can run public utilities more efficiently than governments. Even that one they didn't win. You know, it was closer, but uh, they didn't win. And this idea that privatization mainly benefits the corporate sector, or utilities are too important to be sold off, enormous public support for that. So this is why privatization has become a dirty word, and why they don't use that word anymore. It's also why you won that debate uh, here over the electricity system and the land registry, and it's also why you've got the potential to win the battle over the other forms that privatization is going to pop up its little crocodile head um, <laughs> here. So privatization has become very unpopular. So this is what's behind all this rebranding and dressing it up and coming up with new gimmicks to try to sell the same concept, extract profit from the production of a public good or service. Have I said that before? I can't remember. Uh, I think I've said it 42 times. Has somebody written a question saying, when is he going to stop saying that? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. OK. Uh, so what are the ways that it gets dressed up? Well, public-private partnerships was a new thing you know, uh, a couple decades ago, but it's not new anymore. And I think most people understand public-private partnership is really just privatization in another form. And think back to our map and the locations of privatization, right? Public-private partnerships certainly privatize the capital ownership end of it. Sometimes they also privatize the operation uh, of it itself. Sale lease back is where the, the government sells the asset and then leases it back from the person they just sold it to. Um, totally transparent way to extract profit. You know, if you owned it in the first place, why the hell did you uh, sell it and pay rent? How many people do that with their own home? <laughs> you know, you have to be in pretty desperate straits to sell your house to someone and then beg to stay there and pay rent for it at a profit for the, for the landlord, right? Uh, social impact bonds, this is a uh, trendy, uh, trendy one that frankly I think is not going to amount to much because it's so far-fetched. Um, the idea is you um, um, a private company comes along and promises to achieve some kind of benchmark, a quantitative benchmark in, um, in some kind of public policy or public service area. It could be to reduce the number of prisoners who go back to jail after they've been released or improve the number of kids in a neighborhood who get um, decent immunizations or anything like that. And they promise to do it, and the government um, has a bond, a piece of paper that says, if you do it, I will pay you this much. That's the idea of a social impact bond. And it would be enough to justify the cost of doing that, plus a profit, a healthy profit margin for the company. And the whole argument is somehow this will allow private companies to come in and succeed, where all of these ambitious public sector organizations, healthcare facilities and education facilities and, and everything, criminal justice facilities couldn't succeed, but somehow a private company can come in and do it because there's a piece of paper being dangled uh, in front of them. It's a gimmick. It's absolutely a gimmick, and the international experience with it has been very bad, uh, and so I honestly don't think it's going to go very far, but that doesn't mean we can't, we, that doesn't mean we, we can ignore it. We have to be ready to whack that crocodile uh, down. Um, Various other ways that uh, they'll try to hive off a little bit of a public service, create a little department uh, somehow, spin it off as a separate company. Initially, it might even still be owned uh, publicly, but they're starting to operate it like a private business again, that marketization uh, that we talked about. Another gimmick now that we've got to be careful of is that, that they're going to try and put a human face on privatization by saying you can be the owners yourself, you workers. You know, either by buying shares in it, that's often a way of trying to get privatization through, or through super funds. Uh, and of course, super funds, even the industry funds, are looking for places to put their money. And frankly, privatized assets have been consistently super profitable. So, you know, they're interested, uh, or at least they feel the competitive pressure, they can't ignore it. Um, so this is tricky. We can, you know, we can have a debate over what our industry super funds should and should not invest in but we shouldn't for a minute let their interest in making a profit um, on these investments influence our decision whether something should be privatized or not. That would be a disaster. 
Um, all of these gimmicks have got one thing in common. They all come back to that initial um, idea, finding somewhere in the map uh, to extract private profit from producing public goods and services, generally without absolving themselves of all the public money flowing there, right? That's the point. Uh, if it was true privatization, it would be the market, and you wouldn't have billions of dollars coming in subsidies for vocational education, right? The whole private vet industry would never have existed without the public money. Uh, early childhood education, aged care, now the NDIS, all ways that public money for a purportedly decent purpose is being sidetracked into supporting uh, private uh, profit. Uh, now, let's talk about some of the gimmicks that we're facing here in uh, WA. I've heard that since you successfully defeated the drive to privatize Landgate, uh, now the government is looking at the idea of a private partner to run it uh, for 40 to 50 years uh, with all these exclusive rights in terms of what they would, uh, what they would do with this um, money machine, really. A land registry is a pretty good money maker. Uh, because, you know, you're, first of all, you're providing a necessary service to make the property market function uh, and make communities uh, function. Um, and it isn't that complicated, really, uh, to run a good land registry. So you're going to give it over to someone else for 40 to 50 years. They're going to get paid handsomely, have all this power. They're going to be the only ones who know how to run it at the end of 40 to 50 years. That's one of the problems, right? Uh, so what is that? <laughs> that is so transparently just another way of doing the thing that they tried to do in the first place. Um, and I don't know, honestly, what their rationale is. I don't know if it's technocrats in the Treasury Department who are so obsessed that this must happen, or if they're actually making a political judgment that they, they want to um, uh, get the money up front from it. It's a money loser for government in the long run. It absolutely is. Um, new Body Infrastructure WA, an agency to oversee the infrastructure program in the state which in and of itself is a good idea. We need more planning and integration and intelligence brought to infrastructure spending so that it isn't a um, politicized thing that gets turned on the year before an election and turned off right after. Uh, it's all of this talk about alternative financing models that is a danger in this one because they're clearly looking for ways to involve private capital and it's just going to be a public-private partnership by another name uh, if that happens. Uh, apparently, the WA Chamber of Commerce and Industry is interested in this social impact bond idea uh, to resolve complex issues. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a complex issue is all the uh, financial speculation that happens with all these pieces of paper. Um, if you want to resolve complex issues, stop giving them more money to play with. Um, and then there's a push from some segments of local government, probably those senior local government managers who are pissed off that idiots in the private sector make five times as much as they do, <laughs> who want the same opportunities, you know, and, and or possibly from local governments who think they can sell, a, sell it off and, and, and get a cash windfall or whatever. Um, so they're thinking of kind of setting up independent business-like uh, bodies uh, to run certain parts of local government services. Now, in and of itself, that may or may not constitute privatization, and in the hands of a good government that was ambitious at expanding what government could do, these things could be beneficial. There's lots of cities in the world where you've got publicly owned subsidiaries of local government that do all kinds of things, run publicly owned transit, develop publicly owned housing, manage publicly owned property, um, taking advantage of the benefits of uh, public transit and so on. Um, somehow I think that's not what they have in mind here. Um, it could very well be a precursor to trying to privatize a thing uh, or to get some of the benefits of privatization, including suppressing labor costs, without actually privatizing it. So um, let's be honest about all of these gimmicks. Uh, they are absolutely uh, consistent with our broad, simple definition of privatization as finding ways to extract private profit from uh, public activity. Uh, what have the consequences of privatization been? Uh, a long, long list, and it's the real reason why privatization has become a dirty word. You got enormous duplication when you take something that could be done sensibly through an integrated public 
uh, operation and break it up into different uh, overlapping competing um, <coughs> private operations. Enormous cost and waste with all of these things that businesses, private businesses have to do, market their services, administer contracts, uh, all of the management bureaucracy. Um, we did, uh, through our center, a study on the costs of electricity privatization that we published late last year and just added up the uh, number of marketing staff that were hired by these private electric utilities, okay? So, light bulb on. I didn't need someone to come and market electricity to me, okay? I kind of knew that I needed it, okay? Yet the number of marketing staff grew like by 350%. The number of other managers grew by 250%. The number of people actually doing productive work grew by 20%. And overall labor productivity declined by almost 40% after privatization. So this whole idea that the market knows how to do things efficiently is absolute bullshit. I mean, I, I won't even use that in a technical sense anymore. I'm just calling it <laughs> what it is. Higher cost of capital. Um, private investors pay interest rates more than twice as high as what even uh, state government has to pay. And on capital intensive projects that last for years, those interest costs are enormous. You can double the whole cost of a project uh, because of the compound effect of the higher interest rate. Um, and they're going to get it back. They're going to get it back in, by cutting quality, uh, charging higher uh, fees, uh, obviously lots of uh, corruption and dodgy practices. My favorite was the private vocational trainers who sucked all kinds of students in, you know, have a free iPad from government nominally in the first place. They did it, and it was an absolute, utter corrupt waste, purely driven by the private market, okay? So there's a good case study of uh, how the market uh, doesn't work. And at the end of the day, if they collapse, and they often do, that certainly happened with the vocational uh, trainers, and it happens with all kinds of other uh, things, the state is always there to pick up the costs, and they will be. There's no doubt that the profit is private, but the risks and costs are socialized. And, and it's because these things are providing an essential public service, and we need it. That's the whole thing. So when the, public, when the private producer goes bust, we will demand, and rightly so, that our governments go in and, and, and pick up the pieces. And we'll say, why the hell did you privatize it in the first place? Okay, but in the meantime, we still need this. So uh, my, uh, my top three are, I think I've pretty well touched on them all. Electricity generation is just a fiasco and just a waste. Vocational education. Oh, my third one is employment services. This one where we're going to pay people by the head who go in to look for a job. And um, I discovered this because I didn't know how this worked because when we, when we first came here, my kid actually uh, finished school and then was looking for a job. And in Canada, you would say, go to an employment service office and they'll help you find a job. But my kid wasn't on New Start and they wouldn't even let him through the door because they can't make money off it. And that was when I suddenly, it took me like three weeks to figure out this is not a public service actually, this is something else. And also a disaster in terms of the actual outcomes and the disservice that's done for people who are trying to find work. Uh, I will make reference to this report, uh, The Costs of Market Experiments. It's a good case study in how privatization uh, doesn't do what it's supposed to. It talks about the decline in productivity. It talks about the cost for all of us, right? All of those wasteful marketers and administrators and contract uh, lawyers have to get paid and they get paid by us. This is why electricity has gone up. It's got nothing to do with renewables, nothing to do with renewables and everything to do with waste, duplication and the profit motive applied to what should be a centralized public utility, okay? And this 75 bucks that the government's gonna give people <laughs> once doesn't start to offset the $200 per household per year that we all pay in the dead weight excess cost of, um, of that wasteful system. The government backed down today on the New Start people, eh, on that 75 bucks. That is interesting. That shows they're on the run, I think. That shows, again, we are winning, we are winning the arguments. Uh, let me finish off. I'll just quickly run through a few of the myths that they use to justify this whole charade. Government is not broke. Government cannot go broke. Government debt is small. Uh, 
relative to anyone else in the economy, relative to corporations and certainly relative to households. I always love it, you know, when the treasurer stands up and says, we're going to be like mom and pop at home at the kitchen table. They take care of their finances and, and we're going to balance our budget just like mom and pop do at home. Okay? I got news for you, Mr. Treasurer. <laughs> mom and pop at home are not coming close to balancing their budget. In fact, they're in debt up to their eyeballs. Okay? And in some cases, it makes sense, right? Companies borrow money to pay for investments in long-lived productive assets. Households do as well. Why not governments? This whole idea that you have to pay off debt, that public debt is bad, uh, private debt good. And now, obviously, Mr. Frydenberg yesterday said we're going to pay off all the debt by 2029. We just have to re-elect them three times <laughs> to get there. If he was the CEO of a corporation and he stood up and said, I'm going to pay off all the company's debt by 2029, he would be fired the next day. He would be fired as a superstitious idiot. <laughs> Seriously, this is absolutely dead serious. A company executive who said, that is our top priority is to pay off all the company's debt, the shareholders would look at him and say, what planet do you come from? Okay? If you take on debt to make investments to earn me profits, you're doing a good thing. And someone who won't do that shouldn't be in that position. That's absolutely true. So this whole idea that he's running it like a company is, um, uh, oh, I'm going to run out of technical terms by the time <laughs> this lecture is done. Government debt is the most secure financial asset going. That's why the interest rates are so low. For the Commonwealth, the interest rates are almost zero in real terms. For the states, they're maybe 1% in real terms, and uh, government can't go broke. Moreover, even if government was going broke, privatizing assets wouldn't help because properly accounted, selling off a public asset does nothing for the deficit. You're trading one asset, a real asset, for a different asset, money. And on the balance sheet, they will be the same. If they aren't, because you've got some kind of gain that you're going to declare, all you can declare against the deficit is the gain. But then why is the gain there? It means somebody's paying more for the asset than you think it's worth, or at least than you said it was worth. So then why were you saying it was not worth that much in the first place? Okay, So it's got nothing to do with paying off uh, the deficit. Private production is not more efficient. Okay, It may be cheaper, particularly if they drive down labor costs under private to ownership. But in real economic operational terms, there's nothing uh, efficient about these overlapping uh, private uh, structures, the wasteful activity that they undertake. The profit margin has to be added in as a, um, uh, as a cost, and the capital costs, as I mentioned, uh, are huge. Finally, privatization does not absolve the public sector of the risk, uh, either of the delays in building or cost overruns in building or the failure to meet um, benchmarks and KPIs in social impact bonds. Um, the public is always responsible for that risk, and it doesn't matter how the thing was set up, at the end of the day, when something needs fixing, it will be the public sector, through the democratic accountability that government has to us, that will go in and be forced to step in. Uh, so the fundamental arguments as to why privatization makes sense uh, are absolutely flawed. How do we resist this? Lots of arguments. Uh, if the asset makes money, like the land registry does in a big way, uh, then you're going to lose the revenue flow uh, into government by selling it off, and you're going to have to pay for that uh, in the form of uh, higher taxes. You're likely to experience a decline in the quality and accessibility of the service because the private producer, as soon as they take it over, is going to be looking for ways to cut costs, including um, uh, deteriorating uh, service. Then you're going to also get higher costs to the public uh, through user fees, uh, profit margins, uh, higher interest costs, you're going to lose uh, accountability and control over the uh, asset, and we've seen this big time, you know, in the electricity system, for example, or public uh, transportation that gets hived off to the private sector, uh, and that can mean a lot. You're going to be constantly facing all kinds of scams as private sector owners find new and insidious ways to make profit, uh, not by doing something useful. And we're going to face an impact on uh, workers and jobs in the, in the privatized organizations, no doubt about it. So again, we have to be careful how we phrase this piece of it. I think it's a totally legitimate goal, especially 
at a time when precarious work is becoming the norm and it's harder and harder, especially in regional communities, to find any kind of stable, decent work. Uh, I think it's totally legitimate to say this is one reason the public sector should be doing this, but uh, it will only work if we build alliances with the people who depend on those services and position the fight as one uh, benefiting the uh, public good. So um, to wrap up, uh, privatization, no matter what the Productivity Commission says, uh, was never about efficiency. It was always about a big project to shift income and power uh, from uh, state-owned and operated uh, facilities to the private sector, and it was part of a bigger project uh, that we call neoliberalism uh, now um, to generally reconstitute business power. Uh, business did not like uh, how the world looked after 30 years of post-war full employment and growing social welfare programs and rising taxes and, and a confident public sector. And this is where neoliberalism came from. When the architects of neoliberals, neoliberalism met at the Mont Pelerin Society in, in, in uh, France and started planning this whole thing, um, this is what they had in mind, was turning that whole ship around and privatization was, was part of it. Now I want you to know, I didn't mention the Mont Pelerin Society, but I'm not like some kind of whacked out conspiracy theorist, okay? I mean. It is true, they met the small group, they did control the world and so on, but <laughs> I have learned over the years, just because you're paranoid, okay, it doesn't mean they're not following you, okay? <laughs> so keep that in mind. Despite that small group that met and now controls the world, the credibility of their project is at rock bottom. You know, Sally McManus said neoliberalism has run its course, and in her usual straightforward, sensible way, she's bang on. She's 100% right. And the uh, credibility of these people to come to us and say, yes, we've taken all this from you, and it hasn't worked, but we're going to take this from you as well, the credibility is zero. So this is a great time to not just stop them selling off more stuff, but actually raise a pretty interesting demand, which is let's take back some of the stuff that was sold before. And it can't be done for nostalgia's sake. It can't be done because I want to go back to those good old days. It has to be done because we put concrete arguments in place as to why this thing would work better if it was publicly owned and uh, operated. And there's lots of examples of that uh, these days. Uh, the utilities in Germany were all privatized, and now there's an enormous movement that's remunicipalizing them buying back the water and the sewers and the um, municipal electric utilities uh, with that exact uh, idea. There's a real movement in Britain to re-nationalize the rails, which is the poster child for failed uh, privatizations. Um, we've got a chance with vocational education now. You know, uh, it's obviously going to depend on the uh, election and everything else, but we've got a chance to say, no, uh, this is not how you deliver vocational education. We once had a world-recognized system. We are now the laughing stock of the world at how useless our vocational education system has become. And we're going to rebuild it with TAFEs and the concept of public, high-quality anchor institutions at the center of vocational education. Uh, we've got a chance to win that one. We've definitely got a chance to win the electricity debate because it's been such a fiasco and uh, people are paying for it. Um, we got this whole bunch of rabble rousers in America of all places. I'm kind of jealous. I mean, I grew up in Canada, you know. In Canada, we spend our entire lives patting ourselves on the back <laughs> for being better than Americans. You know? <laughs> in fact, half of us have repetitive strain injuries <laughs> from doing this. In fact, I think a few Aussies have this same uh, repetitive strain industry. I, you know, I love this. Uh, inequality is horrible here, but at least it's better than America, you know, which unfortunately isn't saying much. Uh, but anyways, here they are raising the idea as part of a bigger package of um, putting people back to work and rebuilding communities, public ownership in all kinds of ways, transportation, housing, uh, and more. So uh, I don't think it's just my um, trade union Prozac that I take uh, in the morning. I think I actually feel optimistic that we can win this debate, and you guys have shown us right here that you can win the debate. So thank you for that. Thank you for the fight, and let's make it happen. Thank you very much.